but the banks rejected his loan application, which would have allowed him to expand his business. In a stroke of creative inspiration, he took out two car loans, one for a 1975 Lincoln and the other for a 1975 Cadillac. In 1977, he used the two car loans to launch a new business, Jackson Limo Services. Today, his Los Angeles-based company employs hundreds of drivers, chauffeuring passengers all around the celebrity-studded town. Sometimes you have to take what you can get and make something out of that, Jackson said. Abby Schiller and Samantha Counter set out to create a children's media company. While their children amused themselves on the playground, they would ask parents for feedback as they developed the product. Their informal polls struck a chord with parents, who then became investors in this Los Angeles-based company, The Mother Company, which offers a series of books and television shows for children. The Mother Company wound up raising $500,000 in funds as a result of these playground dates. During a going away party at a bar, Alex Rappaport began telling strangers about his idea to make educational hip hop songs. Most people smiled politely and moved on. But a Columbia Business School MBA student was interested and helped Rappaport put together a pitch for an outrageous business plan competition. The Flockabulary business model was a winner in the social value category, earning $5,000 and the attention of a range of invest investors. That's how Rappaport and Blake Harrison came to co-found Flockabulary, an educational startup based in Brooklyn. Today, its online, its online learning program is used in more than 20,000 schools around the world. Hey everyone, my name is Brandy and I'm a developer, designer, and doer who could out hustle Jay-Z. If you follow me on social, like Mike said, you might be familiar with my little motto. We all have the ability to develop our lives and we're all capable of designing them by doing what we love. It just takes effort on our end. Now, this probably sounds like something you would see on a Twitter meme or some spiritual guru saying. But what I'm going to share with you is a process I have actually used in my own life to accomplish the dreams that I had and the process I will use for all future goals. It's not a silver bullet by any means, and sometimes it takes a few tries to figure out exactly what it is that you want to do, because believe me, it's taken me several. But this formula is key. Everyone in the stories that I mentioned had a dream or a goal. They weren't quite sure what it fully looked like, but they didn't let that scare them. They decided to start building something on the side that they would eventually be able to launch into their full-time livelihood. So what do I mean when I refer to staging and production in our personal lives? Often, our current production build, job, life, is stable and predictable. That's good, but it's not always exciting. You want to be a part of something that you're passionate about, something that truly brings you joy. This means using your spare time and weekends to run staging environments, side projects, and experiments. Maybe this is building an innovative product or an open source project that you're particularly passionate about, or it's learning a new skill set to change your job role and responsibilities. It's the thing you're testing and building on the side in a safe place to eventually deploy as your production build, your full-time, everyday job. This is so important because our life accounts for at least eight hours a day, five days a week. A little different if you're in the tech industry, it's about 10 to 24 hours a day. <laughs> Steve Jobs said it best with this quote, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied in what you do is to, is to do great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking, don't settle. 
As with matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking until you find it. Don't settle. This means try new things. We are so scared to break out of our comfort zones and try new things. Yet you know, we can spend hours browsing social media, coveting other people's successes. We get caught up in the dreamy part that we ourselves forget to do. Maybe a feature or a product proves to be a flop, or the new skill that you learned isn't exactly what you hoped. Don't let that discourage you. That's what the staging environment is for. The only way you're going to know if you've found the right thing is by having tried all the things that didn't feel right or that went wrong. Remember, this staging environment that you're setting up is something that you're doing in your spare time, your weeknights and your weekends. It should be something that you enjoy and that brings you personal growth. How many of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a motivational theory in psychology made of a five-tier model, often depicted within a pyramid. The first is biological at the bottom, and then it goes to safety needs, love and belongingness, and fourth is self-esteem. Self-actualization is the fifth topmost need in the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The growth of self-actualization refers to the need of personal growth and discovery that is present throughout a person's life. A person is always becoming and never remains static in these terms. In self-actualization, a person comes to find the meaning of life that is important to them. Everyone here in this room is unique. And the motivation for self-actualization for each of us is going to lead us in different directions. For some of us, self-actualization can be building and creating applications. For others, it's teaching, running a company, or working in a corporate setting. For me in my life, I was working in marketing. More specifically, I was running a very large mobile focus conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was working long hours, and I realized if I was going to put in so much time, there should be a purpose with the work that I'm doing. Running the conference was a two-woman show. Yes, two women. We handled the marketing, the sales, design, and all the logistics. You name it, we did it. But the only thing that we could not do was build the mobile app. This is what sparked my initial curiosity into development. I knew that if I wanted to grow in my career in the tech industry, I needed to learn and understand the development process. I started playing around with HTML, CSS, and WordPress. This happened on my weeknights and my weekends. I started to feel this joy and this overwhelming sense of interest in my work that I was not feeling in my 9 to 5. And this is where my staging environment was born. Maslow believed that self-actualization can be me measured through the concept of peak experiences. This occurs when a person experiences the feelings of joy, euphoria, and wonder. It's important to note that self-actualization is a continual process of becoming, rather than a perfect state one reaches of a happy ever after. This is very important to keep in mind through every step that I cover. This requi requires us to be constantly challenging ourselves and to be asking what it is that we're seeking in these staging environments. So how do we do this? How do we actually set up a staging environment and send it into production? We are going to go into the nine-step process that I have used multiple times to accomplish a successful production deploy. Now, nine steps might sound like a lot, but they're very simple, and you're probably familiar with some of them. But I am here to show you how I've applied them to my own life. Who is ready to launch some cool stuff into production? Me. Yeah! <laughs> What's the what? That's step one. Remember, our staging environment is a thing that we're working on and testing on the side in our week, nights, and weekends. For me, this was learning to code. I had no problem spending my spare time on these online learning platforms. I was even coming into the office on the weekends to build these side projects. It gave me a sense of purpose, and it made me feel smart. 
What is it that you're trying to do? What is your what? What do you find yourself working on late at night and, eating, and reading endless blog articles about? Take a few seconds right now to think about that. Maybe it's business strategies, programming techniques, education. Whatever it is, dive a bit deeper with it. What about business strategies is so <laughs> intriguing to you? What about building React apps with React Native is so awesome? What is it about these things that makes you want to put in your valuable time? Now that we have defined the what, it is very important to identify the why behind that. And that's step number two. What is your intention for learning these new skills? What is your why behind setting up the staking environment? Are you wanting to branch off and start your own company? If so, why? Or are you wanting to expand your knowledge into different areas so you can get a different position at your company or maybe a different role at a different company? Understanding your intention behind your actions is so important because it allows us to understand the motive behind it. Knowing the reason why we do something or why we react to certain things in a certain way gives us a more in-depth look at who we are as individuals and it also helps us to feel more fulfilled in our work. At the time, I had wanted to learn to code because I felt that I wasn't able to do my job to its full potential. I wanted to be able to do everything and that included understanding the development process for both web and mobile. I wanted this understanding so I could knowledgeably communicate with my entire team. And the only way I was going to be able to do that was by learning to code. Now that we've identified our internal motivation, tell somebody. This is step number three. Talk about your dreams and goals out loud. Okay, I'm going to need some audience participation. I want everybody to tell the person to their right one of their goals. Just one. I'll give you 30 seconds. What's your goal? What's your goal? I think that was somebody else out there. That's about an awesome team of people <laughs> cool projects. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got this. <laughs> And then the question started. 
Would I ever get a job as a programmer? Would I even be taken seriously as a programmer? By a show of hands, how many of you have felt this way? Overcome by self-doubt. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> how to overcome self-doubt in step number five. The questions in my head were endless, but I finally had to tell myself to shut up. We ourselves are the ones that control if we're going to do something or not. We have the ability to make up our minds and go for it or not to. It's up to us to decide if we are going to give in to all the questions and all the doubt, or if we're going to prevail and win. This isn't going to be the only time this happens, so start early in the process by telling yourself to shut up. Now that I had cleared my head and quieted my self-doubt, I was able to make the decision of the one thing to do next. Notice I said one thing. For many of us, even after we quiet that inner voice and we start changing the messaging we're telling ourselves, we forget what it is that we're exactly going after. Or we get stuck in the endless options. And being in the tech industry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But let me tell you a little secret. There's always going to be endless <laughs> options. And yes, the feeling of being overwhelmed isn't going to go away. If you don't ever choose something to focus on, you won't make any progress. Even if you choose something and it ends up not being quite what you imagined or it fails, that's okay. That's what this staging environment is about. It's for testing and experimenting on the side. By making that first decision and picking something to focus on, you are one step closer to finding that one thing that will actually set to production. <laughs> and you begin building that life that you always dreamed about. For me, after moving past the overwhelming feeling, I decided to make a pros and cons list. Whether or not to jump into programming full time. By the end of it, I had a full on presentation for my parents convincing them that I needed to move to Florida to pursue my dream. I made that one decision to embark on programming full time and go to school. Now, one important thing to keep in mind when you're picking one thing is money. Unless you're one of the lucky winners of the lottery or you live in a world where money is not required, you need to choose something that's going to make you money. So how are we going to do that? Are there similar companies, projects, courses, etc., out there making money that you can learn from? This is about identifying how you're going to bring in revenue to this staging environment. Once you're able to make money in your staging environment, you're getting closer and being able to push it into production. So how many of you know the ABCs? Well, when you get to this phase, it's about generating revenue and the process you're going to use to achieve it. In this phase, it's all about the ABCs. Always be closing. Now, you may not have thought of yourself as a salesman or saleswoman before, but in reality, we have all been in the sales game since we were tiny tops. Anytime you convinced your mom to buy you candy or got a beautiful someone to go on a date with you, you were selling. You were selling your mom that you would behave better if you only had candy or that you loved her more, would love her more. You sold that you were an awesome individual that would enhance the life of the person that you were trying to get a date with. Selling is a part of life. How many of you have applied for a job? Guess what? You were selling. Near the end of my college experience here in Florida, I knew I needed a job to make money. And my dream job was to work at IBM. I had mentioned this to one of my teachers, and he had introduced me to an alumni that worked there. We started exchanging messages over Slack, and I began showing her my different projects in my GitHub repository. She told me exactly what IBM was looking for in an application and a portfolio. So I got to work that weekend, and I built the best portfolio I could using vanilla JavaScript and all those SVG animations. 
because I guess they really like animations at IBM. <laughs> I submitted my application and portfolio, and then silence. We've all been there. It's like the time you spent an hour crafting that perfect text message to send to your crush. The text that you hoped would make them fall in love with you instantly. Every minute waiting for their response is agonizing. But to your surprise and utter disappointment, there's never a response. <laughs> Not even a single emoji. <laughs> By the time IBM got back to me, I already had a job. But I decided to move ahead with a phone interview and the code test anyway, out of pure curiosity. It went great. And the next day I was asked if I could come to Texas to start working. I had done it. I identified an opportunity with leveraging a connection at IBM and sold the heck out of my very, very minimal skill set. Remember, this is a step where you're trying to generate revenue. If you're trying to find a new job, then you need to identify the job you want. But begin generating leads by talking with people. This could be online, at meetups, conferences like this. Doesn't matter the space, you just have to show up. For instance, if you're looking to get into VR, which is a new and exciting thing, you probably don't want to go to a WordPress meetup. If you're trying to get into VR and you're showing up at a WordPress meetup, I would really question whether or not you understand what VR is. Ask yourself, where do individuals in my prospective industry hang out? Be smart about the process. Figure out who is going to be at these meetups and conferences. If you see a speaker, attendee, or an organizer doing something that you want to do, make it a point to find them and talk with them. This is just how sales works. You identify a lead and you go after it. Now I'm going to share a story about how I was able to generate a lead and go on a journey to the great state of Washington. This was sort of an accident, but it taught me a valuable lesson in generating leads through social media. See, social media is a great place if you're looking for leads or to connect with people in your prospective industry. Because behind every social profile is a real human, most of the time. I was on Twitter one afternoon, and I liked a tweet from a guy who worked at Microsoft. This led him to check out my profile and then my YouTube channel. That's why it's always important to make sure your profiles are employer friendly. But that's another talk for another day. <coughs> he then sent me an email about a position at Microsoft he thought I'd be interested in. He thought correctly. The phone interview went great, and the next steps were an on-site visit to talk with the people there and also try out for the actual job. And by try out, I mean it felt like I was trying out for the Olympic Games. There were a series of interviews spanning five hours. But the very last one is what stuck out in my head. See, the position I was applying for was for a very specific role at Microsoft, which involved a lot of on-camera and studio time. I was placed in their studio in front of several cameras, alongside a member of their .NET core team who had been with the company for 16 years. It was a back and forth conversation comparing JavaScript to C-sharp. In that moment, I knew I really needed to sell myself because unfortunately, I have very limited knowledge of C-sharp. I sold like I had never sold before. And by the end, I think I have a great shot at this job. Even one of the guys sent me a text afterwards saying he hoped they hired me. I rushed back to my hotel and I passed out for a few hours just to wake up to catch the red eye home. And then, about a week later, I hear back. I didn't get the job. I was shocked. After realizing the reason why, I was upset for about 10 minutes. And then I'd use it as fuel to get better at my craft. <laughs> he told me what I needed to do to be considered for that position in the future. I took that and I ran. The thing is, things don't always work out the way we want them to or the way we think they should. When we fail interviews or a product flops, 
We can't let that get us down. We need to think of it as building armor. When we hear no, or we face these inevitable disappointments, we need to learn from it and turn those failed experiences into successes. When I was going through school to become a programmer, I failed my first intro to programming class. It was clear that my teacher did not think I had what it took to be a programmer. And honestly, after that class, I wasn't 100% sure either. I was then told I would, it would push back my graduation by three months. I was very disappointed in myself. So I scheduled an appointment with the program director and told him there had to be something we could do. <coughs> he looked over my work and said, it's very clear that you need to retake this class. So he said, I will let you take it online, and then you'll continue on your program and you'll be able to graduate on time with the rest of your class. I took that failure as momentum to work harder and to always show up, and to not let other people's opinions of me cloud my vision for my own life. I was starting to build up this armor around me, and I wouldn't let no affect me. This is a skill requirement for life. You are probably thinking, okay, great story, Brandy, but how do I apply these steps to my life and my staging environment I have set up? Now, I want to share with you how the process of testing and staging and launching, launching to production can be used on things other than just getting a job. So step number one is identifying the what. Josh, my husband, had wanted to start his own company. Ever since he was little, he had been entrepreneurial. Step number two, identify the why. Why did he want to start his own company? Because he has a passion for products and serving others. Step number three, telling someone. He told a few of his brothers, myself, and some friends. Step number four, get a mentor. He reached out to a guy that he had met at a coffee shop who had started several businesses and had extensive knowledge running technology companies. They spent several meetings together talking and discussing future business plans. Remember, mentors can come from anywhere. Coffee shops, online, you never know. Step number five, he had to tell himself to shut up because 95% of businesses fail. He questioned whether he would even be able to make money on his own. Step number six, he had to pick one thing to focus on. What would, his, what would his business be? He went back and forth between a product company or an agency. He landed on agency in order to develop, in order to generate revenue and build a team of incredible people. Step number seven, making money and generating leads. He knew that in order to make money and to be a successful agency, he would have to land clients. He spoke with his dad and his brother, generating leads, who were in the automotive industry. And he then came up with software solutions for everyday problems that they faced. They pitched the company, signed a contract, and began building the solutions. Step number eight, building armor. Not all of their product pitches worked out, and not every person they submitted a proposal ended up working with them. That's just business, though. Once he embraced it and continued to push forward, he began lining up clients and projects. And step number nine, repeat. Create a repeatable model. For them, it was about creating a repeatable process for building a great team and working with clients. He knew that if he wanted to continue doing what he loved forever, he would have to find a model that wasn't going to be a one-hit wonder. That's why they continue to use this model when developing new projects. So for myself, my what? Step number one. I wanted to be a creator, someone who brings something into existence. I wanted to take my knowledge and share it with as many people through whatever medium I could. Why? It's an act of service. I wanted to give back to the community, and knowledge is only useful when shared. Step number three, tell someone. 
I told my boyfriend, now husband, that I wanted to do more with what I had learned on this journey. I wanted to teach people to believe in themselves and they too could build awesome things and do what they love. Step number four, mentorship. I started following different creators on YouTube, reading content on Medium, and reaching out to people on Instagram to hear their stories. You see, mentorship doesn't have to be a meeting with somebody every month. It can be an online personality that you can engage with, ask questions, and get guidance from. Step number five, I had to tell myself to shut up. I had to keep telling myself that I knew a little bit to at least help one person, and that one person mattered. So I decided to pick one thing. I decided to start creating tutorials. Okay, well how am I gonna make money, and where am I gonna generate leads for this? This step is about making money and closing deals. Once again, I use social media to help. I commented on Ryan Carson's Instagram. If you don't know who that is, he's the founder of Treehouse, an online learning platform. My comment was something like, if you ever need help creating content, let me know. This led to an email, then a phone call, and a contract signing a couple weeks later. Step number eight, building armor. I heard several no's along the way. No's to speaking requests, no to tutorial ideas, and no to book ideas, and several negative comments on my Instagram and YouTube. It never stops. But my reaction to them changed. I used those no's as fuel to keep trying new things. And then the last step is to repeat. If you're able to repeat it, you may be on to something. So for me, I just kept changing my step six, pick one thing. I started speaking at conferences, which led to putting on coding workshops. Then I started creating YouTube videos to help motivate people to go after what it is that they want. And all that led me here in front of you today. So let's recap. Step one, what is it that you are wanting to build in this staging environment and launch into production? Step two, what is the why behind it? You need to have a solid understanding of why you are trying to do something in order to be successful at doing it. Step three, talk to someone. Talk to someone about your staging environment. Start building that accountability early. Step four, seek out a mentor. If you can't find someone, surround yourself with books, videos, podcasts to grow your knowledge in that area. Step five, don't give in to self-doubt. Self-doubt can destroy a dream before it has the ability to get off the ground. Step number six, decide what it is that you're gonna focus on and zoom in on it. And step number seven, if you believe in it and you're willing to work on it in your spare time, you better be willing to get out there and sell it. And step number eight, don't be afraid to hear the word no. And nine, repeat. Thank you.